Welcome back to Movies TV Mad. You can follow me on X at Movies TV Mad and on Instagram and on Fred's at Movies TV Mad X. A very warm welcome to Monday's edition of the Movies TV Mad Daily. Ghostbusters Frozen Empire is one of the symptoms of the many new Hollywood problems. In fact, there's a big problem in English speaking Western entertainment. They are all on their financial knees, TV broadcasters, studios and streamers. They're all on the verge of bankruptcy, but why? Well, as I've already said, Ghostbusters Frozen Empire is one of the major, you know, it's a, it's a symptom of one of the many problems they're facing today. Because there's no originality in entertainment. So all we're getting is sequels reboots and relaunches and people are fed up of the lack of originality but that isn't the only reason people are fed up of reboot sequels and relaunches let's look at ghostbusters afterlife and frozen empire it lacks the quality of the original two movies it lacks the warmth and entertainment value of the original two movies now, Ghostbusters Frozen Empire brings back a lot of its original cast. Bill Murray, Dan Aykroyd, etc. And that's exciting, but these are very older gentlemen now, right? So it's not going to have the effect it once did. And the new cast that they've brought in since Ghostbusters Afterlife don't have that je ne sais quoi you know, don't have the ability, that warmth, to make you laugh naturally. And also, entertainment today lacks that warmth and humour we once did 30, 40 years ago in our Western entertainment. Because back then you could make a police academy movie where the policemen go into a gay bar called the Blue Oyster. And it's funny. You can't do that. You can't do that. You couldn't even do that. You couldn't even have gay guys going into a straight bar and having the hilarity in that. Because someone's going to get upset. The problem is the behaviour police are running our world. We, the public, have become the behaviour police. The industry have become the behaviour police. And we're all paranoid about what we're going to see next. Consumer confidence is at a record low in Western entertainment. This industry, today's industry, especially New Hollywood, and even if you look at a show like Doctor Who and its showrunner, Russell T Davies, he's blatantly told Doctor Who fans that he hates us. I would suspect that he probably hates straight men, right? I'm a straight man. I'm someone who's always loved Russell T Davies for what he gave me personally with his relaunch of Doctor Who. But what we saw with his not so specials, well, they weren't very good. They weren't anything that celebrated 60 years of Doctor Who. He spent his time making fun of Doctor Who fans for not liking change. Deciding that Davros, a very iconic villain, wouldn't be in a wheelchair anymore because apparently villains in wheelchairs, disabled villains, are a problem and a bad stereotype. I've asked everyone this question, and no one agrees with Russell T Davies about this. We are being run with by the behaviour police, but then you look at Russell T Davies, who's not so moral himself. We had John Barrowman, who I loved as Captain Jack Hartness, allegedly running around the Doctor Who and talked with sets, with not much, not, not wearing very much, doing things that his colleagues weren't happy about. Allegedly, I can't prove this is true, right? But anyway, now Christopher Eccleston again, allegedly, who was concerned about the safety and the environment that his cast and crew were working in, was blacklisted by RTD and the BBC. So it's interesting, isn't it? So he's not so moral himself. Lots of rumours of unethical work practices during the original era of Doctor Who. In fact, many, many months ago, 
I noticed on Instagram, Russell T Davies is still following Noel Clark. So it's the hypocrisy of the behavior police. Like, so people like Russell T Davies who were making Doctor Who a certain way now have decided to become the behavior police themselves. We're constantly kind of given interviews in marketing of entertainment these days, you know, where we're told, ooh, someone shouted on me once, shouted at me on the set. Someone called me a girly girl. We don't care. We are sick and tired of your nonsense. So what's happened now is we know them and they don't like us and we don't like them. That's a big problem within a consumer-based industry if you don't like the people making entertainment for you because they don't make very good entertainment. As I say, the warmth of entertainment has left the building. Something as basic as the 18, and I mentioned this the other day somewhere, you know, that show had warmth. You know, the banter between Murdoch and BA was so beautiful and so wonderful and so simple. Something like Knight Rider, where you've got David Hasselhoff talking to a car, which has more warmth and, you know, more banter within it than most of the entertainment we get today. There was nothing po problematic. It wasn't sexist. It wasn't racist. It didn't, you know, it wasn't problematic compared to these days, but it worked. We've lost the warmth from entertainment, from the writing of entertainment. Because here's the thing, 30, 40 years ago, they cared about what they were delivering to the public. If they made something the public didn't like, they would come out and apologize, right? Now, these days, they don't seem to be making entertainment for us. They don't seem to care the levels and quality of the entertainment they deliver to us. And if we don't like it, they'll blame us. They'll even accuse us of being is and isn't. It's become a very divisive, problematic industry. I'm not saying that those problems weren't within the industry many years ago. We know it's a very dirty, corrupt industry that isn't policed from the outside. For example, Me Too and Time's Up was an attempt from the industry to police itself from within the inside. You can't do that. You need an independent body to police Hollywood, and they don't want that. They'll tell you that's not the way things are done. Of course not. This very week we've heard about the Nickelodeon story where children were sexualized. And, you know, there's a deeper story going on there. I'm not surprised about that. I knew about that years ago. I know many, you know, notorious things going on in Hollywood in terms of sexualizing children and child abuse. It's a major sickness in the entertainment industry. Just look what happened with Jimmy Savile. So it's a sickness within their industry and it can't be policed from the inside. This is an industry, especially Hollywood, that needs to be gutted. You literally need to burn it down and start again. But the people running it are so deluded. And, you know, they're full of moral outrage towards their consumer and other people, but they don't look at it, they don't look at themselves in their own hypocrisy. They're lecturing people about gun control, right? And then there was an incident where a young cinematographer was killed because a real gun they were using had actual ammunition in it. How can you be lecturing the public about gun control when you're using real guns on your sets? It's a problem, especially today where you can make, you can do anything in post-production. Is there any need to have real bombs going off or have, having real dynamite and shit like that? It's only a fucking film. Films are my life. Entertainment and stories are my life. But people's lives are more important than the vision you're trying to give us. There's also another problem. I mean, I love directors like Denis Villeneuve and Christopher Nolan, but they take themselves so seriously. And there's no character or personality within these people anymore. You know, and there's something else. Back in the old days, 30, 40 years ago, 
when brewery companies were taking over these studios, they would kind of try and find out what the public wanted. And they found out that young people were starting to watch movies. So they started, you know, bringing in younger directors coming out of film schools to make films for younger people. The results of that are Superman 78, Star Wars 77, you know, and, you know, different filmmakers like Coppola, Lucas, Scorsese, etc. Well, they're not doing that anymore. That's why you're seeing the same old filmmakers and the same old actors doing yet another film. So it's not very exciting. There's no movie stars anymore. There's no glamour anymore. Um, and I mean, if you're going to throw Sydney Sweeney at me, she's just a woman who likes to show her chest. There's nothing to see there. Well, no pun intended. So, you know, we're not dealing with Vivian Lee, please. So this must be one of the lowest moments in, in the entertainment industry, in the Western English speaking entertainment industry in my lifetime and probably within any lifetime. They've decided to go to war with their own audience. It is, a, don't tell the entertainment industry this, but it is a consumer based industry. Just like working in a shop is. The difference is I can shop in a store where I don't like the owner of the store. But you've got to like the people's films and television and streaming shows you're consuming or you're not going to watch it. We were lectured by someone called Zach Stentz, an access media journalist for criticising a director for experimenting with artificial intelligence, saying this director was only experimenting with a couple of things. First, it's a couple of things. Then, it becomes mainstream. Uh, let me be fucking clear here. I will never watch a film, a television show, or a streaming show that uses fucking AI. And if I've consumed that by mistake, th without knowing it, then that's not my fault. But I, I don't, I am not fucking interested. I'm quite happy to live with the historic entertainment I have on physical media here. I've recently been watching something called RoboDoc, which is a documentary about the very first RoboCop movie. And I wouldn't say it's an education because I know the industry very well, thanks to my father, but it shows you the craft and pride that went in to making things. You know, it's just, you know, it's amazing, you know, it, just to see that documentary and see what kind of films we were getting when I was a young guy. Robocop is a unique fucking movie, but it isn't really about a technical policeman who's actually part man, part machine. That's how they sold the movie. It's about someone whose life is stripped from them and they have no free will. And within this soul of this character, this character becomes a human being again and fights for his freedom. It's a fucking beautiful story. It's a brutal story. The bad people are very, very bad. You hate them and so you should. But watching that documentary and seeing some of the motion capture they were doing. And I love the old techniques in making movies and you know, I don't get excited when I'm, I'm when I'm watching BTS and I see, oh, we did this on CGI. That's not interesting. I'm not interested in seeing how you create CGI. I'm interested on, you know, in stop motion capture. You know, I'm interested in the old techniques, you know, in map paintings and things like that. It's interesting when you see these old movies and TV shows and how they made them. It's fucking fascinating. And we're getting a lot of these documentaries right now. So, excuse me, yes, maybe old Hollywood was very alpha male -y. Maybe there was a lot of bad shit, not maybe, there was a lot of bad shit. There's still a lot of bad shit going on behind the scenes in Hollywood. But they cared what they were delivering to their audience. You'll never clean up any industry, but we don't want children being abused. Let me be clear about that. We don't want women or men being sexually abused or groomed or raped. It's a very, very bad industry, right? We understand that. But we're talking about quality control here. And that's the most important thing about this discussion I wanted to have today. 
because Western English speaking entertainment is deluding itself. This is not going to be over. Right now, we have a civil war in the Disney boardroom, right? And it's about politics, plain and simple. The right versus the left. But whoever wins that power struggle, Disney is fucked. Fucked. Left, right and centre. Because they decided to become an extreme left company and go to war with half its audience. You're a consumer-based industry. There's nothing wrong with representation and inclusion and all of that stuff when it's done in the right way. But they piled in there with their Doc Martins and they didn't do it in a clever way. And they put the consumers back up. Let me give you a comparison or an analogy. You know if someone's got their back turned to you and you and you go up to them to scare them, you try and give them a scare fright for a laugh. At first, they'll have a go at you because you scared them. But then they kind of accept it and they think it's funny as well, right? Well, this is what Hollywood should have done. Entertainment should have done about representation. But they're stirring, they're gaslighting people all the time. They're looking for trouble all the time. And I, I, the other day I spoke about that short story I just came up with about the little girl who kept on bashing the beehive with the stick. It doesn't matter if the hive, if the bees don't rise after the first few times, you bash the hive. In the end, the bees will rise up and they will sting you. This is, this is what happened. This is why Nerd Roddicks became a platform, geeks and gamers, you know, and the critical drinker and all these people. And, and like it or not, these people do have smarts enough to expose Hollywood. I don't agree with their politics, but I like what they say about entertainment because it's true. And these people wouldn't have risen up if Hollywood didn't become so elitist and so authoritarian politically. And, but it's not just about the political situation. We are here, we are here today. They're on their knees today because of creative bankruptcy. Just like how they try to embrace streaming. Like all the big studios tried to go after the Netflix model and they failed. It's another reason they're on the verge of bankruptcy. It was obvious that studios like Warner and Disney and Universal that have been used to dealing with the cinematic model, then going to physical media and digital media, you know, were never going to be able to be successful at streaming. But they didn't just want to tap into streaming, they wanted to turn streaming into mainstream viewing. They didn't understand. People want to go to cinema. People want physical media. And I think when streaming first came out, some people started saying, oh, I'm not going to buy physical media anymore. Now, people are worried that physical media will cease altogether. I don't know what I'd do without the physical media I have at home with me. And then you get people like Jude Apto saying it's getting very worrying because, you know, companies are selling their products to other companies. Netflix are selling to HBO. HBO is selling to Netflix. That's a good thing. You know, for example, Dallas used to be sold all around the world, the TV show, right? That's OK, but they're worried because they don't get to make more shit. They don't get to make as much shit as they're making today. It makes no difference to me, Jude, how much shit you're making. You can make no shit because I'm not going to consume it. Because as soon as I see all the marketing in New Hollywood today, I don't fucking touch it with a barge pole. I rarely see any new entertainment because I simply don't trust you. Many years ago when my dad was still alive, he wrote me a list of the people in the entertainment industry that I could trust and the people that I couldn't trust. A very, very interesting list, which I will never divulge, by the way. Um, but it, and it wasn't just actors, it was, you know, it was crews, it was producers, it was companies, it was directors, it was lots of different people. And it was a very interesting list. And maybe when I looked at that list, I went, wait, you, I can actually trust this person. And it's interesting. So it is interesting in life when that happens. But yeah, my dad was very much connected into the entertainment industry. And he knew the good people. And there are good people in the entertainment industry. There are two 
there are still good people in the entertainment industry. The problem is there's more bad ones than good ones. The vital component here is, and why we have a problem and a disconnect with this industry, is that the people working it, at, the people who work predominantly in the industry today, don't care about what they're giving you. They just want to sell it to you. As long as you watch their shit, they don't care. But for example, the people making Robocop wanted to make something good. And I mean, they were making a film that put themselves in danger. I mean, there was big explosions watching this robo doc. The, the, you know, the actors were talking about the explosions nearly touching them. Very, very dangerous. But they cared about what they were delivering to you. You know, you've got, and I forgot the name of the, there's Dick Jones and the main henchman, right? And what they, that there's a scene where Dick Jones is having a go at the main henchman. And basically the main henchman is saying, yes, sir, no, sir. And the actor playing the main henchman was saying, you know, this, this is not going to work. This guy is a badass, you know. He's got to be acting like he works with him and not for him. And in the end, the director let him do it and it worked. And this is what I love about collaborative, you know, collaborative efforts. This is why I, I love about my amateur dramatic society. I don't just go in there and say, I'm going to write and I'm going to direct for you. We don't. We just improvise. I don't write anything. I direct them, but we improvise. They decide their characters. They decide their character personalities. It's a collaboration. The best movies, the best TV shows, the best plays always happen with a collaborative effort and not a dictatorship. The problem is there's not much collaboration going on in Western entertainment today. So there's not just one reason why entertainment is on its knees. And like all the fans and nerds I talk about are very depressed about this. But ultimately what you should thank your lucky stars about is that we've got all the old stuff on physical media and we can enjoy it. You know, the St. Oz Jude Apto said the other day, old people are getting too comfortable with old stuff and they're not watching new stuff. Yeah, there's a reason for that, Jude, because the stuff you in new entertainment are making isn't fucking good enough. So our old stuff we grew up with is giving us that warm hug. We need a warm hug. Entertainment hasn't got warmth in it anymore. So Jude, if you're worried about people watching old stuff, make new good stuff and stop. You know, I'm not talking about Jude Apto directly. I'm talking about the industry blatantly. It doesn't know how to talk to its public, especially when they're marketing. Nobody wants to, nobody wants you to say, oh yeah, we're being inclusive, right? Ain't we good? Pat us on the back. Hey minorities, ain't we doing you a favour by letting you play with us? It's fucking insulting and the public know it's insulting. When you're marketing a movie, I want to know what the movie was about. Did you have fun making it? The, you know, what is, what are the characters, what is your character's traits? What do they like? What don't they like? Where is this movie going? I don't care about your politics. I don't care that someone called you a girly girl. I don't care that someone shouted at you, Rebecca Ferguson, a long time ago. And, you know, I don't care that Johnny Depp shouted at you, right? Um, whoever that actress was, right? I don't fucking care. The public don't give a shit, right? Only the silly little shills that are on, you know, are on Film X Twitter all fucking day. And they're not the full ticket, right? Real people... Real fans of movies, TV and entertainment want to be entertained. They want to be uplifted. They want to be educated. They want to see something incredibly special. And they want to see entertainment that's special to you. The industry itself. When you're making something, you've got to feel it. And the problem is most people making entertainment today are not feeling it. This is another problem as well. Most creatives and most studios are a bunch of con merchants, right? They're just trying to con you. You know, Bainoff and Weiss, who did Game of Thrones, a couple of con men, they're now on Netflix talking about how they decided to reject them, you know, millions and millions of dollars to carry on making Game of Thrones. Well, HBO will be very grateful you then take up their offer after season fucking eight. But there's too many wise guys, too many, let's say, con merchants with no talent. No talent whatsoever. That's one of the biggest things that today's entertainment industry lacks. Ability. 
talent to insert warmth and good characterizations and good stories. So if we're not uplifted, if there's no reason to watch your shit, why should we watch you? And you know what? It seems to me today that people in the industry think we owe them our view just because they worked hard. Oh, we worked really hard. Why are you shitting on us, right? But I notice you never moan, right? When a critic shits on you, you just moan at us, calling us toxic, right? Working class, everyday fucking people. That's the problem. You're in your bubble in California and you simply don't get it. It's as simple as that. I don't want to hear some singer moaning that she's just, people see her as just a sex symbol. We don't care. There's children being killed in the Middle East. There's people starving. We don't give a shit if you're being sexualized. Do you understand? We don't care if men are saying, oh, you're hot. It ain't a problem compared to the problems people are facing today. We're sick and tired of your nonsense. Your job is to entertain us. That's your only job. We don't care about your views. You are not going to influence who we vote for. Do you understand? You cannot change our votes. Gina Carano spoke about being open about her politics and why, you know, it should be okay to be open about your politics. But the thing is, for every political opinion you're giving, you're hurting someone, whether you say it in a nice way or a bad way, because they feel the opposite. And that's why in the old days, we all used to keep up our religious opinions and our political opinions to ourselves, so we didn't hurt each other. But everyone's become a rain man who doesn't have the intelligence to understand there's some things we shouldn't say out loud. And this is really the big problem with social media. And the entertainment industry have gained this disease. They don't know when not to speak. They don't know when to shut the fuck up. So it isn't just the fact that they're doing relaunches and reboots and sequel after sequel that the industry is suffering. But that's part of it. But of course, if they were making good sequels and reboots and relaunches, it wouldn't be a problem. We'd still moan that there's not a lot of originality, but at least we'd enjoy them. And as I explained on the top of the show, Ghostbusters Frozen Empire and Ghostbusters Afterlife simply lacks the warmth of the first two movies because they didn't, didn't employ the right people to write it, to, you know, perform in it. Let's, I mean, a great example of this because I don't like the toxicity that went along, you know, in making Ghostbusters 2016, the all-female Ghostbusters. You know, this is when it all started, when they started, you know, being obsessed with identity. I didn't like that they were putting down men. I didn't like that. But at the very least, when you look at the people they cast in that movie, they were female comedians. They'd come from comedy backgrounds. So they actually understood at the very least, what Ghostbusters needed to be. But they pissed people off so much, and that's why that movie tanked. I'm not saying it's a great movie, but they had the right idea, because they had a director who understood comedy, and he cast people who also understood comedy at the very least. And it's one thing that the last two Ghostbusters movie hasn't done very well because they're relying constantly on nostalgia. They made a Flash movie with nothing to it, and they threw Michael Keaton in there, hoping that the, the nostalgia would blind everyone to the creative bankruptcy. You know, Rogue One's a classic. I remember a moment in the first moment, the first scene of Rogue One. And when, she, when she's a little girl, and she's in that kind of place that looks like Luke Skywalker's house, right? I noticed that there's a milkshake, the same milkshake, basically, that Luke Skywalker drinks in a new home. And I'm thinking, shit, they put it in the frame, they put it in the camera on purpose, just to create nostalgia over a fucking milkshake. This is fucking ridiculous. And I was banging on and on about this, and as usual, everyone just ignores me and doesn't listen to me, and it's fine. But all they've got now is nostalgia. They're using your nostalgia. Listen, I don't need to watch new shit to get nostalgic. I can watch Ghostbusters 1 and 2 whenever I want and get nostalgic. 
They're making a new Superman film, right? But who told them that the public, the general public, want a Superman movie? I love Superman. I'm biased. Of course I want another Superman movie. But the truth is, we don't even know if Superman's popular enough for the general audience to be interested in. They're not asking the public what they want anymore. They're telling the public what they need to see. It's a bit like when your parents tell you to eat your peas, carrots and cabbage because it's good for you. But when you swallow it, you feel a bit dodgy in your tummy. And it's the same thing with modern day Western English speaking entertainment.